Uh -huh. Hello, and thank you all so much for joining us for the class of 1991 reunion, back to school class from streaming binges, binges to travel fantasies, the power of escapism. My name is Minnie Iwamoto, and I am the director of Tropical Disease Partnerships at GSK. I am also an avid movie watcher and global traveler. It is my pleasure to serve as host tonight to learn more about the career paths of my fellow 1991 classmates, Andre Roberts Kester, a luxury travel advisor who specializes in immersive, customized itineraries worldwide, and Benjamin Ormond, an executive producer in the film industry, known most recently for his work on We Can Be Heroes, The Lovebirds, and Our Souls at Night. We will talk about their journeys from Davidson into their career fields, what has shifted in their industries over the past year, and what to expect in the future. I have some questions for Ben and Andre, but we'd love to hear from you too. Before we get started, I wanted to review a few Zoom tips. First, we will keep everyone muted until the very end of the event. Feel free to say hello to each other and submit questions using the chat feature. And questions can be submitted um, to everyone or directly to Hannah Jacob via chat. Please do not send questions directly to me, Andre, or Ben, as we will not be monitoring the chat tonight. We will get to as many as uh, we can. We recommend using speaker view for this event. I know Ben and Andre and I would love to see as many of you as possible. So turn, please turn on your camera if you are in a place to do so. Finally, automated live capture, captioning is currently turned on. To turn captions off, click on the CC live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. This event is being recorded and will be posted on the Davidson YouTube channel with captions. And now, Ben and Andre. Hello. Thank you both so much for agreeing to speak tonight. Um, I'll start with a reflective question for each of you. Um, and we'll start, let's say, let, let's start with Ben on this one. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself particularly your journey from Davidson and how you ended up in the career you now hold. Sure. Obviously, thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Um, my name's Ben Ormond. I go by Ben now, as was pointed out uh, to me that maybe wouldn't everybody wouldn't remember. But, uh, you know, uh, what I found um, going into the film industry, it's a pretty straightforward process. You do your four years of undergrad, then you go to a prestigious film school, do a residency, and then maybe some subspecialty training in the industry. And then, wait, no, sorry, that's medical school. <laughs> sorry, that's how you become a doctor. Uh, no, I mean, look, there is no straight path. You know, I've had this conversation multiple times with people interested in getting into the industry. Like, how do I do it? What should I do? Um, again, without beating a horse or just sucking up to the crowd on the call, going to a liberal arts school gives you a, a huge leg up in terms of being well-rounded, which is, you know, a major part of, you know, being adaptive. Because the reality is if you've ever shot a kid's home movie of your own, you're a movie producer. Um, it's just what we do is a lot more detailed and complex and involves you know, working your way up through the industry because just because you did an awesome job with your kids' home, you know, first birthday party probably doesn't mean Jim Cameron's going to call you to come help him. Um, so my path has been sort of circuitous in terms of, you know, learning everything I needed to know that I could do my job now. It's involved working in different departments on film, but started at the very bottom and, you know, got to the point where uh, with my classmate, Russ Matthews, we were able to produce a movie. And that sort of set me on a path now where, believe it or not, once you've proven you can make a movie, which in an independent version is just a much more developed version of making your kid's home movie, um, then people go, oh, that person knows how to make a movie. Maybe I should call them and get them to help me make my movie. Um, 
and so that's kind of where my career path is now, you know, as a freelance producer, I get called by producers, directors, studios, everybody to come in when they have an idea and go, okay, how much is it going to cost? And how do we go make this? Um, and, you know, that's what I have to figure out. I'm usually given something really complex and we just go figure it out and make a movie. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. And you, it's, it, you sound like, I know you're very humble about this because I know you're big. I know it's big. Um, I looked you up on IMDB. <laughs> so Andre, we'll go to you. Can, can, I would love to hear about your journey. Okay, well, I feel a little bit intimidated because I'm not big. <laughs> but I'm very honored to be here and it's really fun to see everybody. This is not really what I expected for my 30th uh, reunion, but it's awesome. So like Ben, I had a very circuitous route to being a travel agent. Um, but I do credit Davidson to kind of getting me here because I spent my junior year both in France and Italy. The fact that Davidson let, you know, encouraged me to do that. And then I did the JET program after for two years. And I wouldn't have known about it if it wasn't for Davidson. So living in those three countries in three years, well, I spent two years in Japan. So yes, in three years, really just like made me obsessed with travel and learning about new cultures. And um, so that was always kind of in the back. And then I did several different jobs. I ended up going to business school at Dartmouth, um, which had nothing to do with travel, but it ended up having to do with it because my best friend from business school ended up um, buying her father's travel agency about 10 years ago. And we had both quit our corporate jobs to be moms, both our husbands, were kind of more the breadwinners. And she was like, come work with me. And I was like, I don't know anything about being a travel agent. She's like, have you traveled? I was like, I've done that. So, um, you know, it was like, there's no great training other than I think doing it yourself. And I've loved it. It's, so it's been eight years now. And I kind of can't believe that I lucked into this because it's just fit my lifestyle. I can be with my four kids. I've traveled with them. And uh, it's just really fun to talk to people about travel. It makes people happy. So I, I'm thrilled that I've found it. That's great. Thank you so much, Andre. We love seeing your posts and it, it takes us away. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, so is there anything, and I'll start with you, Andre, this time. Is there anything that you learned at Davidson that you use in your everyday work life? Well, other than kind of the background and allowing me to, you know, travel and do all the things through Davidson, I was thinking that that like Ben mentioned, the well-rounded liberal arts education. I mean, a lot of my job is figuring out what clients are going to want to do in different countries, like knowing what they're interested in. Okay, they're going to go to Vienna for music. Are they going to go to Paris for art? Are they going to go to Rome for architecture? And I feel like Davidson gave me such a good, you know, cultural understanding of a lot of Western history and Asian as well, um, that it just is, it, I find that I call on it often, this information day to day. Thank you. And Ben. Um, you know, again, it's funny because so much of what I do, <clears throat> there isn't like a real training program for, because it's a lot, a uh, big part of it is just a logistical job. But what I find, and it's the one thing, it kind of goes back to what I'm constantly stressing to people when I'm filling out like uh, ma marriage, uh, wedding, cards it's like you know communication is the key uh to a happy marriage it's kind of like communication skills and it's like again obviously you can study communication anywhere i don't know that everybody has learned to live in fear of a single misspelling in an essay giving you an f and that the spell checker was uh, an honor code violation so you kind of learn how to write and write effectively and communicate effectively. And, you know, those are things that I point to as incredibly valuable. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of being well-rounded, I, I was thinking about literally the movie I'm doing right now is based on a Czech novel. And I was having my first conversation with the producer and I was like, oh, I've studied some Eastern European literature. And I'm sort of pulling this out of my, excuse the expression, ass because this was stuff I studied at Davidson 30 years ago, but I took uh, basically an Eastern European literature seminar. And it's like, so yeah, I, you know, I was able to talk about a couple of books that I had to go look up what they were. I don't really remember, but it's a frame of reference conversation. I don't think I was going to be given it.
the test, how many other executive producer, physical producers they would have been talking to who've read a lot of Eastern European literature novels that have any kind of frame of reference. So uh, it's what liberal arts education is. It's, it's not about a straight line to getting you to a checklist of credits and everything else either. So, you know, Davidson helped me and continues to in that way. That's awesome. We titled this session, The Power of Escapism, because of the power of movies and travel to take us out of ourselves and expose us to new ideas, perspectives, and cultures. So how did your work shift during COVID? And uh, we'll start with you, Ben. Um, well, you know, it goes without saying, obviously, I was doing a movie in Los Angeles uh, springtime of last year. We were racing to get prepping. We were probably six to eight weeks before we start shooting and, and got shut down, you know, much like the rest of the country. You know, it was kind of an industry-wide shutdown because um, without getting too far into the weeds of what we do, you know, when we prep a movie, we get ready to make it. And there's a whole lot of logistical steps that we have to do. But then we sh shoot the movie and then we turn it over to post and they do all the editorial VFX, whatever. And then the movie's done. Well, industry-wide, you know, everybody saw that their favorite TV shows got disrupted, everything, because it's like we do a pop-up factory is the best analogy I can make. Um, and so there's a whole lot of COVID safety that had to be figured out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have people that have to work unmasked. There can only be so many movies that anybody could stand about the pandemic where you had an actor on screen. And by the way, that's kind of the money is seeing the actor's face and performance. Kind of hard to do anything with a mask on. <laughs> so, you know, it became that like, OK, how do we do this? So the industry had to kind of write new rules overnight and the industry's guided you might have heard or seen the screen actors guild awards the directors guild awards these are things that end up on tv and who cares but you know everybody's got to clap themselves on the back every once in a while but these are all unions and guilds that control our our industry in terms of like what are safe working practices so the industry had a lot of hard work to do to get back to figuring out how we work safely. And so some of that came down to, I don't go anywhere without my KN95. We have testing protocols, we have that. But it was really about focusing on the safety um, aspects of how we do it. And then incorporating all that new machinery into our factory so that we could get back to work. And now we're kind of back to you know, relatively full speed. So don't blame me if your favorite TV show isn't on next year, not my fault. Um, but, uh, you know, we just sort of have tried to adapt and move on. That's great. Well, thank you. And Andre. Well, um, let's see, the spring of 2020 was just nothing. No travel, so very, very hard on you know anybody in this industry. Travel and related services employ 10% of the world. So that was pretty devastating. Mm -hmm. I would say in the summer, intrepid travelers, you know, were really store crazy and people were, as you can imagine, were willing to take car trips, so they didn't have to get on planes, and domestic travel boomed. Um, I mean, I hardly ever used to book the US because people don't think to call a travel agent if they're doing the US. And now I feel like I'm, I'm pretty good on all places to go in the US, like Hawaii, Alaska, out west, like all of those really got a lot of business. Um, and, you know, now kind of like Ben, I mean, these are kind of parallel industries, things are normalizing. And for a long time, hotels, would have great cancellation policies, like at the very last minute to encourage people to book. You know, airlines were blocking the middle seat. Airlines were not charging a change fee. I mean, they were doing anything to get travelers to book. And that's all really gone away because now the surge is back. But interestingly, so many people were laid off and then, you know, airplanes were taken out of commission, rental cars were taken out of commission. But now there's this surge and they can't meet demand fast enough. So like you can't get a rental car in Hawaii or Alaska. Like, in the summer. So if you all want to go somewhere and need a rental car, get it ASAP. 
because there's this weird shortage. Um, same thing with flights. Like people keep asking me, when are the flights going to be back on? And I'm like, I don't know. Like it's, I wish I had a crystal ball. So it's, it's kind of unpredictable now. Um, there's availability. I would say hotels are doing an amazing job with sanitary practices. I mean, they are the first ones that wanted people back. And I would joke that, you know, when I go to a hotel, it'd be way cleaner than my house. Um, protocol after protocol. So I feel like it's a very safe to travel now. It's just the logistics of catching up with the surge in demand is going to be interesting. That's, yeah, I agree. It, it, I, I've been grounded. I, I, you know, typically travel a lot for work. And so I've been grounded essentially the, um, since the pandemic. We'll see what the future holds. So then what is the future for the travel industry um, for you, Andre? Well, I would say we're waiting with bated breath for Europe to open because, you know, traditionally Americans have just gone in droves to Europe for the summer. So what's happened is because, I mean, countries are announcing they're opening, Greece and Turkey are open, Croatia is open and Iceland is open right now. France, Spain, and Italy have all given dates that kind of keep shifting. Maybe it's June, maybe it's early July, um, but people can't really make plans until there's a definite date and the flights are on. So right now what's happening is again the u.s alaska hawaii in the u.s is much more booked than usual because of all of the demand for people that would normally go to europe i would say once we get through the fall people are vaccinated i think things are going to be more normal i mean some big trends that i think have changed is you know going through covid has pulled the typical traveler like three years forward in terms of using technology you know, you used to go to a hotel and there would be an app, you know, Four Seasons app, and I'd be like, I just want to talk to somebody. But now people know how to use it because they didn't want to talk to anybody. So that's actually really made things much more efficient, that you can check in without talking to anybody. You can make your dinner reservations without talking to anybody. And there's someone immediately responding to those apps. So that's a really good thing. Um, people really are looking for outdoor experiences after being in their house for, you know, however many months being in beautiful scenery, being alone, not being on a group trip. They want private, they want wide open spaces. Um, another interesting trend is, you know, before when you had to be in an office, your family, you, you went on vacation with your family for a week and you had to take the whole week off. Like, yes, you might be in touch with your, you know, on your phone a little bit, but now it's like the blending of not being, being, being to be in your office. People can go for longer, trips kind of are more mixed. It's not just pleasure. It might be a mixture of business and pleasure. Um, and then one other thing that I've seen is this really interest in something more experiential, like travel right before the pandemic, people, a lot of people were quite rushed. They wanted to go to Europe. They wanted to go to three countries in 10 days. Like, let's just check it off. And I think that's changed after, you know, a 14 month like pause, like let's go someplace and really experience it, understand it. Um, so I see that as a, a change that people want a longer trip in one place to really feel like they get the culture and experience. And thank you, Andre. And Ben, we'd love to hear from you of how has the, what's the impact of the pandemic has had on, on your industry's future? Well, I'm hopeful that Andre solves all her problems because I'm headed to Prague next month. So <laughs> it's like, yeah. And to, to reinforce exactly what she's saying, I mean, we're dealing with cultural ministers and getting special exemptions. It's, it's a process. And again, that speaks to what I do day in, day out anyway, is we're just given that challenge and we have to navigate the bureaucracy, uh, everything to make it all possible. Um, long story short, I think our industry is going to, we're entering a boom phase, to be quite honest. And it's a, a doubly compounded boom phase because the switch to streaming as a primary distribution mechanism means that tons and tons of content is being ordered in tons and tons of different uh, genres. <clears throat> so, and just the nature of content, you know, it's, I'm not cribbing from one of the future questions, but, you know, you're getting a lot more long form content. There's just hours and hours and hours of content that needs to be produced. So I was uh, thinking about it back when we first shut down, there were all these shows that were in process that were greenlit to some degree. Somebody had already agreed to start making them. Those had to get finished. Then there was everything that was slated to come after it. 
Well, those things just got pushed back. And now you have all these really talented creators, writers, directors who are sitting at home with an unplanned three, four months of their lives. So what do they do? They do what creative people do. They create. And so they're coming up with, so it's like a huge backlog that's waiting on a huge increase in demand. Industry-wide, setting aside all the extra logistical hurdles we have to incorporate, how to do it safely, the main thing is it's just, it's going to be a boom for the foreseeable future until, you know, a possible economic reset. But this industry generally has been sort of, I don't want to say immune, but less impacted by economic resets because people still want to watch things at home. So it becomes that thing of, you know, oh, it's cheaper for us to stay home, cook dinner and watch a movie or watch our binge our favorite TV show. So I think it's just we're in a growth phase for the foreseeable future. Thank you. And um, so we're, we have a question from for you, Ben, from Bob Hornsby, um, my husband, class of 91. And the question is, is there a big one that got away? that you are comfortable talking about? A film you had an opportunity to be a part of and declined, but it turned out great and you wish you'd done it differently? Um, yeah, I, I, honestly, it's a great question. I'm trying to think, you know, Avengers? What, no, I didn't have anything to do with <laughs> Avengers. Uh, no, uh, no, I mean, generally, you know, I, I feel like I've kind of been lucky. Most of the shows that, I've gotten interested in and involved with having conversations I usually end up doing. So, you know, there's stuff that, again, without getting too far down in the weeds, because we could spend a whole hour just talking about what producing is. Um, the simplest thing is that there's creative producers and then there's physical producers. Creative producers are what people tend to think of. They're the person that stands up last on Oscar night and thanks everybody in the academy and gets to give a speech. That's not the kind I am. I get hired by that guy to do all the hard work. Um, <laughs> so, uh, because there's just, it's a lot of problem solving and logistics and, you know, sometimes not quite so glamorous stuff. So, um, no, generally speaking, by the time somebody calls me, the question starts with, are you available? And if I am available, they probably are interested in having me do it. Unless it stinks, I'm probably interested in doing it. So um, it usually works out to be a good fit. So I can't think of any that I was like, ah, oh, I really wanted that. I mean, I've read some things that I was like, it is kind of neat to see things like three to five years and you don't know what happened to them. You just read them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, I remember that. I read that movie. <laughs> There's a, a Kevin Hart movie coming out on Netflix. I think it's called Fatherhood. I read that and I talked to him, but I wasn't really available. So I'm excited to see that because yeah. that's fun for me to see one that, you know, I knew about before. And it'll be nice to see because when I read them, I think about all the headaches that are involved in doing them. So the fact that somebody else had to have those headaches makes me feel good. <laughs> So, and now we have a question for Andre from Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley Harris Gardner, also class of 91. Uh, Thanks, what are your top two to three favorite places you've ever traveled to? Oh my God, this is such a hard question for me, which is why I think I'm in the right field. Like I really, I love to go almost anywhere, but I would say Africa would be my number one um, for a bunch of reasons, just on safari. Um, because it feels so otherworldly and there's something like completely taken out of your body to be with these animals like like I am human and I am one of them um, and like safari just is so far away and such a different experience and I also what I love about safari is I have a lot of families who have teenagers or college kids and they want to take a trip and the kids don't really want to go the kids will always go on safari I'm like you save that in your back pocket till your kids are 20 23 they will come if mom and dad are paying for safari. So safari would be my number one. Um, I mean, I really love any cultural place in Europe. Italy would be my number one, just be between like the food, the wine, the architecture, the art, the fashion, the beauty. Like you can find something in Italy for everyone, I feel like. Um, 
And then, you know, so I have four boys. I only had sisters. And part of my job has been really like using my kids as a, as a guinea pig to do this travel, but it's also been an incredible bond with them. Like I let them each pick what they want. And so through them, I have done things I would never, I'm not that sporty. I'm not that outdoorsy. And we have done so many cool things because of things they wanted to do. So, you know, I really love the outdoorsy stuff now, like caving and spelunking and like, you know, we're going bungee jumping in New Zealand next Christmas. I mean, I would never have wanted to do that, but they've kind of gotten me into it. And now I think it's like a whole nother element of travel, that kind of adventure piece. Thank you. And next we have a question from Cecily. Uh, Cecily Craig Hill Davis, also class of 91. Um, both of your jobs sound really eclectic and seem to require a lot of flexibility. Is there any such thing as a typical day? And if so, what does it look like? So we'll start with you, Ben. Um, Yes, no. I mean, is, is the reality because, you know, in the simplest sense, you know, we have three different kinds of days. We have prep days, we have shoot days, and we have wrap days. Prep and wrap are typical in that I come to the office, I work until I'm done, and then I go home and, you know, go to sleep and come back and do it the next day. So, you know, it can be long. What I think people are always usually surprised our default day is 12 hours. Um, so, and you know, it can be 13, 14, I've worked a 22 hour day. And it, yeah, it's as glamorous as it sounds like. Um, but you know, you just, the reason why it's uh, the no part is a shoot day all depends on what we're shooting. You know, the form of it is relatively similar. We show up, we work for six hours, we break for lunch. We come back, we work another six hours, hopefully, and then we go home. But, you know, along those lines, things go wrong. Um, you know, it takes a lot of adaptability. And, you know, similarly, there's a whole lot of like, oh, we're still not done. Because, you know, we only have one thing. It's like, we have to finish, you know, but it's like, there's points at which we can't finish our day because, one of the aforementioned things has gone wrong. So it's not always we can just go longer. If an actor goes home sick, um, doesn't matter what we were planning to do the rest of the day, we have to do something else. So there's a whole lot of adapt on the fly to it. And, you know, hopefully we can keep moving the puzzle pieces around until we've got a picture that everybody likes. That's great. And thank you, Ben, because I know we're catching you in, in between a break now, too. So we're really... Oh, uh, they're fine. <laughs> they're just, oh, we're not break. They better be shooting. Is uh, <laughs> forget that. And Andre, we'd love to hear about if um, you have a, such I would say My days are either like pretty exciting and great or like as dull as dishwater. So I mean, I'm kidding about that. But, you know, a lot of my job is sitting in this office like booking people's transfers and finding out where they want to have dinner. I mean, sometimes my husband is like, does it not drive you bananas that you do minutia like that? I'm like, no, if it will allow me to travel the rest of the time and talk to people about this great stuff, no, it's fine. So I do a lot of minutia, um, reconfirming people's reservations, making sure if they're celebrating their 50th birthday, that they're going to get a note in their room and a piece of cake. I mean, things like that. And then the fun part is getting to travel. So, you know, there's a lot of travel agent trips that I can go on. I take my family. I travel with friends. I mean, and that's the part I love because I used to love to travel and feel kind of guilty about it. Like, oh, this is indulgent. And my husband would give me a fit. Like, I, you know, want to stay in a nice hotel and this is too much money. Now it's like, no holds barred. You got to do it for work. <laughs> so that's the part that I really love. And I'm like, oh, I have to expense it. It's part of my budget. So th those are the good days. <laughs> that's great. That's great. And Andre, have you been back to Japan since Jed? I have been back twice. And I actually, we were, I was supposed to take my family this past March. And obviously that didn't work out. I postponed it again. That didn't work out. Um, but I'm dying to take them. And they're like, mom, why are you so focused on Japan? It's like, because I live there. You have to see it. And they're not that interested. They don't get how cool it's going to be. <laughs> but I'm like, this is, this is the way it goes with them. They've gotten a little bit jaded lately. <laughs> Thank you. And next we have a question from Greer Martin, also class of 91. Any tips for travel that immerses the traveler in the local culture in a short time span? Oh, good. I think this one's for you, Andre. Why don't you? Take it? 
Well, I was going to ask if you wanted to take that one, maybe in the Czech Republic. Um, Never been. I'll, I, I can do it in a month. <laughs> All right, Grant. I would say, you know, there's a lot of like language classes in like, you know, Central America. Like I would say any type of service or language class. Those would be my first choice. And I don't, to be perfectly honest, I don't really book things like that because I generally have people that want to do something pretty luxurious. And sadly to say the luxurious people aren't always as interested in being immersed, right? Like they want their creature comforts. So that's why I sometimes feel a little weird about my job that like, it's not always the most authentic because you can't be in the bush drinking your favorite mixed drink and it be super authentic. You know what I mean? Um, but the language and the service projects, I think are the best way to immerse yourself. Actually, I do want to jump on the end of this because I did think it's something that I've talked about a lot. The one thing I do enjoy about the fact that yeah, I don't like always having to be gone from home because I do, I leave for three, four, six months at a time. And the best I can do is tourist home, but I've worked in a lot of different places and going for more than just a weekend or a week. I live somewhere and you kind of become less than a local, but more than a tourist. And you can kind of really soak in the, the local culture. And that's great. So I feel yeah. like, you know, I've spent a month in Taos, New Mexico, and that place is awesome. And I would have never known that. I spent a lot of time in New Orleans. If anybody's ever gone to New Orleans, needs a restaurant recommendation, just ping me and I'll get it for you. <laughs> okay, can I uh, jump on that? Ben, yeah. totally. Like if you're cooking for yourself, like going to the local market, and coming home and preparing a meal. I mean, that kind of thing I would book for clients. I was thinking something like really immersive, but just to even cook for yourself and have an apartment or have an Airbnb or a villa or whatever you're gonna call it, that is a start. And then you start chatting with people and it goes from there. So thank you, Ben. I wasn't thinking on my feet. Oh, it's good. <laughs> and next we have a question for Andre from Bob Hornsby, class of 91. Have you seen much innovation in travel? Uh, using a new technology, VR, for example, that has the potential to broaden access to exclusive or bespoke of experiences in a world where people cannot travel or for those who want to provide tiers of experience. Um, yeah, like more money for in-person, less money That's for great, virtual. Great question. I would say the way the travel industry kept itself busy, really, especially during the spring when nothing was going on, is the hotels and the tour operators started creating all these digital kind of platforms and different interesting, I mean, they were still Zoom based, but you, you know, the breakout rooms and all the things that you all I'm sure have seen too, but with great videos and photos. So it wasn't VR, but it definitely was trying to open up these experiences, basically to, to educate travel agents um, as to what's out there. So saying you can't travel right now, but look what you can do. So I could see that that would be parlayed um, into making these experiences more available for people that ne aren't necessarily going to be able to do that travel. I mentioned the technology earlier, and that's a little different than what you're saying, but just making things more smoother and more efficient once you are traveling, that I've seen a big change. Great. And a question for Ben um, from Berkeley. Gardner, um, also class of 91. What are some examples of problems and headaches that you have encountered and maybe solved? Maybe even some crazy ones. Um, yeah, well, there's always the, you know, it's almost, you'd have to just pick a specific show because things happen all the time. I think it was classmate and guy got me into all this, Russ Matthews, was talking about when we were doing our first feature film. It's like, you're starting out to, you know, you need to get somewhere, but you have to build the train. And not only do you have to build the train, you have to lay the track to get there. So you start doing both at the same time, but the train takes off before you're done building the track. And so your only goal from that point forward is to make sure you're putting enough track in front of it that however fast it's going, it never has to slow down and stop. So, you know, headaches are routine. My biggest headache is always tomorrow um, because we've got to deal with whatever comes up. Um, you know, it's weather. You know, we have a plan, not on this, but using an example. If we're shooting outside tomorrow and we get the rain report and it's going to rain. Okay, well, I guess we're not doing that. So what can we do to fix that? And so, 
you know, I've had that. I've had, I was doing a, a reshoot unit where basically we were squeezing our reshoot into another movie schedule, which meant we were going to take the actress on the weekends who's working on another movie. Well, then she got sick. So we actually couldn't use her on the weekends anymore. And the first movie had to fix their schedule as well. So it's like, okay, so now we have to try to like figure out what holds their opening in their schedule. And then, but it's, it's always 10 other pieces that have to be accommodated. Is the location available that day? Is the other actor available? Can we split it in two? You know, there's all kinds of ingenious solutions like, okay, we'll put one person on one side of the room and the other person on the other side of the room and we will shoot one person one day and we'll shoot the other person the other day. So, you know, you're constantly just problem solving along those lines. And maybe we do one shot where we digitally put them together, stitch it together. So it looks like they're in the same shot and nobody ever knows. So um, lots, lots and lots of headaches. It's almost like too numerous to count. <laughs> That's fun. And uh, we have a follow-up question for you, Ben, from Jay Wiley. Class hey, Jay. one. What did your boss say when you were late to a film shoot? Uh, um, basic. I don't remember if I told Jay that story, but it, it was probably one of the best lessons I ever learned. And maybe Jay's thinking about a different story I told him. But um, I was, we were working out in the end of the valley. I, I don't know if he, how many of you guys know LA. I lived in, you know, down South Bay. At that point, I might have still been living in uh Marina Del Rey or Hermosa, but it was a good hour and a half to get to set. And so basically I would leave two and a half hours early, but if you've ever been dinged in LA traffic, it's like, it can just stop for no reason. And so you're basically freaking out, speeding, trying to get there. I get pulled, get a ticket. It's just like nothing can possibly go right. And when I show up, you know, of course, I'm only one part of a team. I was working in camera department, so nothing stopped, but I just got pulled aside by this guy um, who was the guy I reported to. And he's like, yeah, if you're late, you're not, you're not, you're no good to me. And so I learned a, uh, you know, and it's like, he knew we've <laughs> all, everybody who's lived in LA has gotten just hosed by the traffic at some point, but it really impressed. It's like, don't be late. And, you know, it's like, because there's somebody who will show up on time who wants your job. And, you know, it is a, it is brutal because again, without getting too far into the weeds, shoot days are the most expensive thing we do. If I gave you guys numbers, you'd be shocked and outraged because you'd think about all the good that that stuff could do in the world, but you're complicit because you pay for Netflix and everything else. And they decide, you know, to go make this stuff. Um, but the reason why, if you break down the cost of a shoot day over the hours we're on set, you know, it's a pretty easy how much we're spending per hour type calculation. Mm -hmm. And so when people are late and we all have to stay later, basically the cost becomes exponential. So my boss said, don't be late, Jay. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. We have a question for Andre from Jennifer Gray, also class of 91. And it says, I am also transitioning from, from corporate America to travel. What techniques have you found most effective to generate new leads and clients? Instagram. I mean, I know that's, it, my husband cannot stand it. I was not on social media before I started this job. And he thinks it's so tacky that I post all the stuff that I do, but people call me and say, I wanna do that trip. I mean, I've had people from high school, people from Davidson, people from grad school that I haven't talked to in 25 years. And they say, oh, I see that you're in travel. So I would post anything that you do. Um, and you know, and show, I would like to show what there is to do, what my kids liked about it, what everybody, so that's in my number one. I would say, you know, word of mouth. In the very beginning, I said to a couple of friends, you know, I, I feel awkward about this. You know, I was, had an MBA and knew what I was doing in my old job. And this was new for me. And they were like, just dive in and do it. And they were kind of my first clients. And then they would tell other friends that I was okay. And I do think that if you speak with conviction, 
it took me kind of a while to, to figure that out. People, people will listen and they kind of want to be told what to do. Like no offense, but like, if I just say, I recommend this and this is why people are usually like, okay, great. So <laughs> when I was kind of more like, well, I'll give you nine choices and I'm not sure what your family would like, that was way harder. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that helped. <laughs> that, that's great. And can you give us your Instagram handle? Yes, it's andre.kester.travel. All right, that's great. Thank you. And for Ben, I have a question. Um, other than your own films, of course, who or what do you find exciting to watch in media and entertainment right now? Um, yeah, it's really, I guess it's not so much anybody specific. I mean, I've got some things that I can, you know, point to and stuff. I think the most interesting thing is just basically long form storytelling that's coming into play. And you, you see it in a lot of stuff. Obviously, we're all probably been drawn into series stuff that, you know, you're like, oh, I didn't know I was going to watch a show about chess in the 50s. But sure. Um, <laughs> it's like it's kind of we've seen this change of the traditional model, which was movie or TV. That's kind of becoming movies that are longer, movies that are told over single seasons of stuff, that they're almost standalone stories, but they're not constrained. The fact that, you know, I took a class with, uh, you know, a professor in film school that was basically, you know, explaining the actual history of the length of films. And believe it or not, there's pretty straightforward reasons. Basically, it's how big a film reel they could build. And, you know, things like that and how many showings they could fit into a day. These are what the things that sort of focused us down to the form became about the length it's supposed to be. And, you know, films are standalone stories. Basically, partner wrote the first film that uh, Russ and I did together, talks about it all the time. Maybe he was told at film school this, but films are about their endings. So, you know, you need to be able to build a story that makes people fall in love, but the satisfaction comes from the resolution, the actual, how they're ending. Think about, you know, you don't have any, like that was an awesome movie that didn't have a great ending kind of story. TV has traditionally been different. There is, you know, sitcom form, which is you establish people that you like, you give them a challenge of the week. And then at the end, it disrupts the order. And then we reestablish the order. So, you can pick up cheers at any point and it's going to be the same, you know, gang at the bar, something happens, gang solves it, gang at the bar. Um, and, you know, whereas serialized dramas, they kind of grew a little bit, but ER was always about what's going on at the ER this week. Mm -hmm. So to me, the most exciting thing right now is the fact that people are effectively telling movies over longer form. So you get like these, smaller worlds that sometimes they can go back in and sequel but they're allowed to get deeper into them and so i i think that's great binge streaming has been a huge part of that because you know you're not forced to wait and re-engage constantly um but I, to me that's the most exciting part of the industry change um shows like watchmen if you guys have, i mean i'm going to talk about stuff that's been out there because again, I'm, I fall behind even probably some of you because guess what? I'm working all the time making stuff. I don't get to watch. It's the worst thing in the world to be in this industry and don't get to watch as much as I did before I got into it. Um, Fargo, at least season one, that was great. Better Call Saul, I think is one of the best things on TV. And again, it feels like it's building towards story. Uh, Marcella, uh, I'm just looking at the list I wrote down. Fleabag was awesome. Mr. Robot was awesome. Uh, Invincible, if you like superhero cartoons, that's awesome. Uh, you know, Stranger Things. There's, you know, just it's kind of what's your appetite. There's just so many cool things that they don't feel like they are what they were before or later. We're just getting evolution. That's stuff I like. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm glad we're taping this because I want to I want to write down that list. That's awesome. Um, Andre, um, how has the travel industry changed over the years in your experience? 
And what should people think about as they prepare to venture out again? Okay, oh, good question. Um, over the years, um, so I would say, so I've been doing this for eight years. And when I came in eight years ago, people said to me, why would you be a travel agent? How can there be any business for travel agents? It's all online. All the information is there. Uh, your air, your hotel, everything. And I said, we respond, that's a good point. However, if you want something more curated, more high end, then you need someone who knows what they're talking about. And you're not going to find that at, you know, whatever review site you're going to, Expedia or whatever. I mean, I do actually use TripAdvisor. I think if you go through enough of those reviews, you get a general sense about something, but that, that wouldn't be how I would plan my like 20th anniversary trip. So um, I, I think people, you know, it's, the industry has segmented a little bit that there's definitely like a high end group that goes to travel advisors like myself. And then there's the people that are like, I will do all of it myself. And actually my best client is someone who's moving like this, who all of a sudden is too busy, has you know multiple children, lots of different interests. And they're like, I just can't manage all the information online. I'm like, I'm your girl. Um, so that's changed. I would say going forward, some other trends from the pandemic separate from people kind of wanting to be outdoors and wanting to be separate is um, I think people have really seen the, the negative effect, environmental effects travel has had. I mean, we've always kind of known this and, you know, obviously the carbon footprint and the people, you know, people all rushing to these very small sites like Venice or Florence and overwhelming them. Um, the fact that all this wildlife has come back since the pandemic, you know, there's, there's fish and dolphins in Venice now that were never there before. So I think people are more appreciative of the fact that we need to tr like spread the travel, the travel out and come up with places that don't have to be Paris and Rome. Like let's find the secondary cities where you will have to Ferris point a very immersive experience and not be with a hundred other tourists like destroying the environment. Thank you, thank you. And next question for Ben. Um, how have you seen the expansion of streaming services make an impact on the film industry? And how have these evolving channels of delivery shifted the way you think about making movies? It hasn't done much, I don't think. No, yeah, <laughs> I mean, look, it's, uh, it's pretty, uh, been amazingly disruptive. I'm sitting in New York working for Netflix. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a case of they've done an amazing thing continuing what a trend that was going on already and we're probably as guilty as anybody maybe it's our generation but it's not a problem that's unique to us I mean anybody that's ever done the math on how much it costs to take your significant other get a babysitter go out to dinner go out to a movie come back and you're like wow that was really expensive and that was not good um you know, basically, look, it's not unique for us to be like, oh, if there was only something new I could watch at home. So what we're just seeing is a paradigm shift play out in terms of like the industry recognized the same way when Napster came along. People are like, oh, I always wanted that song. You know, I, now I can get it and I don't have to go to a store. I don't have to go find it. It's, you know, my local Best Buy doesn't carry the temptations, but I can get it. And then they're like, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a second, for free? No, not for free. So it's like, how did they, you know, how did they monetize it and make it where it was possible for you to get what you're looking for, which is new content? So, I mean, it's clearly caused an explosion. It's also, you know, it's interesting to me to watch the traditional filmmaking studios who, you know, are distributors primarily, but also content producers have to reinvent themselves and see which ones are agile and which ones aren't in terms of like how they're going to do it. But basically it's just serving the market. Thankfully for all of us, you know, the market has ruled the only movies that make sense to go out through wide distribution channels are four quadrant, that's young, old, male, female um, projects that have some appeal in all four quadrants and primarily have huge drivers of young teenagers because they're the ones that spend the most money going out to movies. We don't, we're all busy. Making time to do anything is just challenging. So they can now 
tailor content to the audience. Streaming, as much as they're providing a product to us, we're also a huge source of information about what kind of stuff we want to watch. Because every time you engage with Netflix, Disney, whatever, you're voting what you want to see more of by what you pick to watch. But, you know, they can take chances on things that can't afford to be released in a four quadrant model. And it's terribly expensive to release movies in theatrical models. So it has completely disrupted it the same way digital watches disrupted analog watches and, you know, basically cars disrupted the horse and buggy game. Um, it's literally going to continue to be disruptive until somebody comes up with some tech that requires you to, you know, you can't get it distributed. But as soon as we all got, you know, even a cable in our house and somebody realized how to unlock the data distribution model through internet lines, we were on this path because now there's nothing standing in the way. There's not some person deciding like, oh, you guys only want to see, you know, Star Wars in your town. It's like, no, nah, you know, we can see something else instead because you just turn it on at home. So I think it's great. It, it has democratized. We're getting a lot of interesting voices that wouldn't be heard because the market wouldn't bear it out. And I think that's great. We're getting a lot more experimental stuff. Um, so I think... I think it's a net positive for the industry and for viewers. Thank you. And we have another question for you, Ben, from Kat. Um, and it is, do you always produce for big studios or do you ever do smaller independent um, films? And if so, do you have a preference? Um, so it's kind of, it's funny. You know, I started out uh, Russ and I basically just did it ourselves and we basically went and made a movie. I have done Independence. Uh, Lovebirds, um, which came out in the pandemic on Netflix, is the smallest movie I've done in a while. Of course I would, but here's the dirty little secret. It's show business. So at the end of the day, it's, it's really just a factor of, you know, when I'm not at home and Believe me, you know, it's a sacrifice. I think everybody knows, but we work professionally to get paid, compensated for our time. So, of course, if the right project came along, I would, but it kind of has to fit because, you know, the reality is a small movie couldn't pay me what I'd get paid for the same time per week on a bigger project. And if, you know, a lot of what I do is I give financial advice to producers and the first advice is, yeah, don't hire somebody as expensive as I am because your budget won't bear it out. Just like I'm sure Andre would say, like, yeah, if you want to this really high end trip and you don't want to pay a fee, then don't hire me. It's like, good luck planning your trip. But it's like, you know, of course, I help all the time in terms of talking to people. And, you know, I read scripts, give people advice. But yeah, to get me to show up, you got to pay me. And so generally speaking, it tends to be bigger stuff now. It keeps getting a little bit bigger. But favorites, probably indies, because, again, you're doing generally more interesting, creative stuff. You know, it can be a little formulaic. But the one I'm on right now is pretty darn big, and it's really creative and interesting. So oh, Great. We can't wait. And so this is – we are almost at time, and so this is the last question. And this is for both uh, Ben and – Andre, um, from Bob Hornsby, and it is, can you cobble together an immersive gaffer's assistant travel experience on a Keanu sequel? Uh, yeah, I'm, Andre, if it's a Keanu sequel, I can just tell you we're going to have a hard time pulling this together because the cat has aged out. <laughs> and yeah. You know, Actually, here's I don't the, even know what a gaffer is. I'll yeah, tell you that's that. How foolish I am. The, the, basically, the little dirty secret of Keanu is the kitten was actually like six cats, maybe more. We had cats that were athletic. Same thing on the dog movie I did, Max. We do a lot of dogs, but uh, it would probably have to be Los Angeles um, because I don't think the director or either one of the actors would do it uh, anywhere else. We actually set it in Los Angeles, but shot it in New Orleans. 
So, uh, you know, there was those challenges faking, uh, faking Los Angeles in New Orleans. But um, the gaffer is the, uh, the set lighting technician, the key set lighting technician, the person that sets and adjusts all the lights and little trivia for you to go away when it, you know, whatever trivia contest you do. Call the gaffer because they had a long stick that they would use, a gaff, to actually push and adjust the lights so they didn't have to bring them down off the stands. Thank you. It just, it stuck. So, um, yeah, generally it's a union job. So there's not a whole lot of tourism opportunities, but I'll leave it to Andre to speak to (laughs) setting up a trip for New Orleans or Los Angeles for you. I could do either of those with ease, but I'm not sure about the whole gaffer situation, piano situation. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Well, Okay, so, well, thank you. We are at time, unfortunately. So thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, To Ben and Andre, a special, special thanks for taking the time to share your career journeys and perspectives. I mean, you were cool 30 years ago, and it is great to see you are still just just (laughs) as cool as ever. Still Um, faking it. Awesome. (laughs) Take it till you make it. It's all good. (laughs) So for those of you who are in reunion classes, if you have not already done so, please register for reunion weekend. It only takes a few minutes and you can decide what you will attend after you register. Um, For my classmates in the class of 1991, I hope you will join us for our virtual class gathering, which is Saturday, June 5th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And there are many other events for all reunion classes. So please, please, please make sure to look at the schedule online. So thank you once again, Ben and Andre and everyone online. Um, And at this time you can unmute yourselves and say hello.